Hey, what's happening, everybody? Mr. White here. We are going to talk charge today. So if you've ever been on a playground slide and when you got off, you went too close to somebody and shocked them, if you've ever shuffled across the carpet and touched a doorknob and got shocked, if you've ever had clingy clothing that comes out of the dryer, then you have had experience with electrostatic charge. So what exactly is charge? Well, charge is a property of matter that is used to determine how the matter will behave in an electric or magnetic field. Now, charge is a property, and just like other properties like momentum and energy, charge is conserved. So you can't create it, you can't destroy it, but you can transfer it around. So where does charge come from? Well, everything's made of atoms, right? And atoms themselves are made up of three basic particles. Uh, you have your protons in the nucleus, you have your neutrons in the nucleus, and circling around the nucleus in their orbitals, you have your electrons. Now, those particles in an atom are charged, and so protons are particles that carry a positive charge. The way I remember this, proton starts with a P, positive starts with a P. Electrons are particles carrying the negative charge. And if you're not sure how to remember that, well, the only other option is neutron. Uh, and neutrons are neutral. So neutron, neutral, uh, that just leaves electrons to be the negative charge carriers. Now, this is hugely important when we're talking about static electricity and transferring charge. Electrons are the only things that will transfer between atoms. Protons will not. The strong nuclear force, one of the four fundamental forces in the universe, holds the nucleus together and holds protons in there pretty tightly. So they're not going really anywhere unless there's a nuclear reaction that does it. Electrons can leave their orbitals rather easily, um, some more easier than others. And so because they can escape, those are the charge carriers that are transferring to and from atoms. If you did move a proton from one atom to another, if you removed a proton from an atom, uh, it would become an entirely different element. And if you added a proton, it would become an entirely different element as well. So protons are not moving. If we're talking about moving charge, it's always electrons, never protons. Write that down. Ions are atoms that have lost or gained electrons, so they have a charge. Now, typically, atoms are neutral, meaning they have an equal amount of positive and negative charges. But when you add or remove electrons, the negative charge carriers, you have created an ion, which is basically just a charged up atom. So again, if nothing else, remember that if an atom or object becomes charged, then it either gained or lost an electron, not protons. All right, if we wanted to determine if an atom or an object is charged, we need to look at its charge carriers. So if an atom or an object has an equal number of protons and electrons, an equal number of positive and negative charges, then we consider that object net neutral. It's net charge. The charge that's left over is zero because all of the positives cancel with all of the negatives. And so if something like an atom, uh, you, uh, a ball, anything, if it has an equal number of positive and negative charges, we call that neutral. Now, something is charged if it has an unequal amount of positive and negative charges. So if you compare the number of positive and negative charges in something and they are different, then that object has a charge. And the way you figure out what type of charge is you figure out which it has less of and more of. So if an object or an atom has less electrons, so less of the negative charge carriers, than it does protons, it's gonna have more positive charge left over when the charges cancel. So in this example, I have one negative charge and three positive charges. Well, that one negative charge cancels with a positive, leaving two additional positive charges. And so my net charge is positive. And that works the same way the, in the other direction. If something has more electrons than it does protons, so more negative charge than positive charge, we say that that net charge is negative. It has more negative charges left over after all the canceling is done. So that charged object would be negative. Now when we describe charge, we use a unit of measure called the Coulomb, which is named after Charles Coulomb. Quick history lesson! When we abbreviate the Coulomb, we use a capital C. It is a capital, an uppercase, not a lowercase. When we use a variable in formulas for charge, we use the letter Q. 
Charge is a scalar quantity, meaning it has a magnitude, but it does not have a direction. Now, I know we've been talking about positive and negative charges. The positive and negative don't imply a direction. They imply a type of charge. So we use positive and negative to differentiate between the two types of charges because they both behave differently in an electric field. We need some way to differentiate, and so we use positive and negative to do that. So again, positive and negative in this case do not mean a direction. They are just a way of differentiating the types of charges that we have. So an example down at the bottom here, we have this green box I have labeled Q. Remember, Q is our uh, variable that we use in formulas for charge. Q equals positive 3 coulombs, or positive 3C if we want to abbreviate that. So that means that it has a positive charge, and the amount of charge that it has is 3 coulombs. Now let's say I wanted to get 1 coulomb of charge. Well, one electron carries negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs of charge. And that looks like this if you were to write it out. So it's a very tiny number. Now to equal one coulomb, it would take 6.24 times 10 to the 18th electrons. That looks like this. That is a huge number. That is a lot of electrons to get one coulomb of charge. And so a coulomb of charge is quite a bit of charge. Now, are there any ideas on how much charge a proton, a positive charge carrier, carries? Well, if you guess that they carry an equal amount of charge as an electron, but just positive, then you guessed right. A proton cancels out with an electron. If you put a positive charge and a negative charge, a proton and an electron together, their net charge would be neutral. Um, even though the proton has a much greater mass, it still carries the same amount of charge as the much less massive electron. So when objects interact, they actually experience a force from each other. Uh, one object exerts a force on the other, and the other exerts a force back on the first one. That's Newton's third law. And so that force, a push or a pull, depends on the type of charge. And so like charges will repel, they'll push away from each other, and opposite charges will attract, they will pull towards each other. This is similar to how magnets work. If you've ever played with magnets, you put the North Pole and the North Pole together, they want to push away. If you put the north and the south pull together, they want to pull together. Now the amount of force that two charged particles or objects experience can be determined with Coulomb's law. And Coulomb's law tells us that the force experienced by both those objects or particles is equal to the Coulomb constant K, which is equal to 9.0 times 10 to the 9th Newton meter squared over Coulomb squared. I know units are crazy. Uh, times the amount of charge of both of those objects, so charge of object 1 times charge of object 2, divided by the distance between them squared, and that squared is important. Now if we analyze this a bit further, we can see that electric force is directly proportional to the amount of charge of the two objects interacting, and it is inversely proportional to the distance between those objects. And because of that distance squared, changes in distance have an exponential effect on force. Let's think about magnets. They work in a similar fashion. If I put two magnets together, there is a force between them. If I increase the strength of those magnets, that force increases as well. But if I increase the distance between those magnets by pulling them apart, that force drops significantly. These are the same set of relationships that are seen with electric forces as well. All right, let's do a little practice. Uh, go ahead and pause the video so you can try these problems out on your own before seeing the answer. The answer will be displayed shortly, and there is another page of practice problems as well for you to do after this one. If you need additional help, please get it. It is always a good idea to get extra help if you're having trouble. Thanks for watching, and good luck with the practice.